This is Big Ideas from the ABC. I'm Miriam Lyons from the Centre for Policy Development and I'll be your MC for this evening. Um, before we get started, I just want to give you a little background on what inspired us to invite Pavan Sukhdev to do a speaking tour in Australia. The Centre for Policy Development is a progressive think tank devoted to making good ideas matter. We're especially interested in the ideas that ne get neglected because of short-term thinking in both the public and the private sectors. Good ideas that get shelved because they have long-term benefits but short-term costs, like putting a price on carbon, for example. Uh, we're also interested in ideas that are in the common interest but are fiercely opposed by vested interests, like, say, a fairer return to Australians for our non-renewable resources. So I first stumbled across Pavan's name in the interim report released by the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Project in which he pointed out that we're trying to navigate some very complex terrain using a defective economic compass. He also referred to Adam Smith's observation that prices are often out of whack with what things are really worth. Water is essential for life, yet incredibly cheap. Nobody dies without diamonds, yet diamonds are expensive. Which brings me to tonight's topic, what is the world worth? The cost of the global financial crisis stunned the world. How does this compare to the cost of bailing out bankrupt ecosystems? After years of running down our natural capital, are we getting close to an environmental version of the credit crunch? Climate change has been grabbing most of our headlines in recent years, but we're now actually coming up against multiple environmental limits at once. We're running out of fresh fish and water, and we're living through the greatest mass extinction event in 65 million years. Pavan's work looks at what this tells us about our economic system and about how it needs to change. He'll describe what it would take to put nature on the balance sheet, and he'll then be joined by a panel of local green economy thinkers to talk about what that means for Australia. Now, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have mobile phones, please put them on silent. If you're using them to tweet, um, and we actually will have Twitter going up during the panel discussion and Q&A, uh, the hashtag is Pavan in Oz, P-A-V-A-N-I-N-O-Z. Um, the format is that panel will give, Pavan will give a uh, lecture first um, and then we'll have a short panel discussion uh, and then there'll be about 20 minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to want you to um, write down your questions, make them very, very short. We're talking tweet length questions here. Uh, race down the front to the microphone um, and uh, ask very short, pointed, concise questions. Um, just before I invite Pavan on stage, I just need to make a few thank yous. Um, first to the people who made this event possible, um, the amazing CPD staff, the board, our volunteers, uh, to, of course, our principal sponsor, Qantas, without whom Pavan would have had to swim here. Um, the major event sponsors, KPMG and UTS Business, uh, again, without whom tonight would not have been possible. Um, so just a few words on Pavan, and there's actually a lot more on Pavan uh, in the little flyer on your seat, and he is really worth reading up on, but I'm going to make the introduction short. He is the head of the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Study, um, which is getting dubbed really uh, stern for nature. So think of how stern has been adding up the, the costs of climate change. Pavan's been doing that for everything else. Um, and it's really quite an important study, and it's been coming out with a series of reports, so TEEB for policymakers, TEEB for business, uh, and, and soon, coming up, uh, TEEB for citizens, so I'm sure we'll all be interested in that one. He's also um, the head of the Green Economy Initiative, which is run out of the United Nations Environment Program, uh, which is also doing some really important work. The Green Economy Report, uh, which has again been coming out in stages, uh, is uh, due to be released early next year. And he is doing all of this while on sabbatical from Deutsche Bank. So, you know, this is kind of a hobby. Um, and I think that we should all give him an extremely warm welcome, a very big round of applause, applause for all of the work that Pavan is doing in his spare time. Please welcome Pavan. Thanks, Miriam. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here while on my sabbatical. <laughs> I, when I went on a sabbatical, uh, it was assumed that I'd be enjoying myself for doing almost no work. I can assure you that this one has turned out to be quite different from that expectation. It's been a lot of work, a lot of reading, a lot of writing, and a lot of travel, as you can see. And thanks uh, to the CPD, the Center for Policy Development, for organizing this, because it's not often that uh, I get to visit uh, Australia. 
uh, Sydney, a city I love, and North Queensland, which is after I finished with you guys, uh, where I have a small patch where uh, many years ago I started offsetting my footprint, but more of that later. Today, uh, the topic is quite easy, actually. It's, what's the world worth, right? It's a simple enough question. What's the world worth? All right, well, off we go. Um, so before you value something, you need to see what it's about. So here are some pictures from my friend, Jan Arthur Stretron. That's a glacier in Argentina, a water reserve, if you like. That's right here, the Great Barrier Reef. And you can see by distance a tiny little helicopter, which is uh, in the corner there. That's a forest, and actually in Russia, huge carbon store. Here's another forest, a rainforest. This is the Amazonas, <coughs> massive store of carbon, but also fresh water. So what's all this world worth? What's this biosphere worth? So to get the answer to that question, it's very straightforward. Just look at a world without a biosphere. Anyone recognize this? Mars, yeah, exactly. So <coughs> no biosphere means clearly not much life. I, probably none. Uh, definitely no humans, therefore no society. No society, no humans mean no transactions between them. In other words, no economy. So the economy here is worth zero, exactly. Then we have a world with a biosphere, which has, of course, lots of life and human beings, society, massive amount of exchange and a massive economy, one economy, therefore. So what was the difference? Well, one minus zero divided by the original, which is zero. So the answer is infinity. That's it. The world is worth infinity. Thanks. Okay, then. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam, the problem was not the first question. It was that subtext that you put in there, you know, putting nature on the balance sheet. Why did you have to make my life difficult? <laughs> anyway, so I'll, let me answer the other part of it, you know, the subtext, putting nature on the balance sheet. That's a little bit more complicated. For that, you need to understand what is nature. And the way one expresses it, and I know these are horrible terms, biodiversity, ecosystem, ecosystem services. You know, sometimes people think that perhaps the reason people invented the terms biodiversity and ecosystems is that they wanted people not to understand what nature is about. And of course, to make life even more difficult, everything that comes free to us, clean air, fresh water, you name it, is called ecosystem services. But in a, in a short summary, what I'd say is biodiversity is the living fabric of this planet. It is essentially at the ecosystem level, which is that agglomeration that you saw in terms of the glacier or the forest or, or the coral reef. And it's also at the genetic level. And each of these levels of biodiversity, each of these levels of the living fabric of this planet actually provides economic value. In other words, welfare, well-being, and benefits to society. Take the ecosystems. From there, we can get recreation by visiting them. You can get water regulation as it, the, the rainfall from the Amazonas. You can get carbon storage. All of the forests are massive carbon stores. At the species level, fish, for example, are food. The quantum, the, quant the quantity, the abundance of fish matters. Design inspiration, well, hardly any ads without any ele no element of nature in them. And of course, services like pollinations. Of course, bees don't send invoices for pollination, and that's part of the problem. <laughs> because the economics of nature, the well-being that it generates is largely in the nature of public goods and services. And that is, in fact, the genesis of many of the issues and problems that we face today with the loss of ecosystems and biodiversity. But the question to be asked is, why bother? I mean, isn't this obvious? Why do you have to go through the process of economic evaluation of nature? Well, let me try and address that to you, and then also try and explain how it is to be done. Because nature is something wondrous. It is our only home. It's worth infinity. We've just established that. Uh, why do you need to put value to the ecosystem services that you get from it? And how do you do this? So in simple terms, yes, it's wondrous, and it's, if you like, envisioned as a three-dimensional colorful ball. Uh, my colleagues call this the discosphere. sphere I'll figure out why they say that. <laughs> but the problem is this, that you're trying to measure something that is multidimensional in an axis, which is a single-dimensional axis. It's essentially the dollar axis, if you like, the economic value. And if you don't, then there will be other things, there will be other uses of land which are measured in economic value terms, and it will result in trade-off choices, which means that nature would be destroyed, while nature would be replaced by built areas, by, by agriculture, by just human ingress into, into areas which are natural. The thing is, in order to 
balance that, that equation and also sort of balance that trade-off that is happening. You have one end of the scale which has something that's measurable, tangible, like a factory or, or a piece of agricultural land converting land into crop value. And on the other, you have this mystical stuff which you don't put a value to. To balance that, you need to measure nature's services into society. And then when you do that and actually present two sides of the coin, your choice can be quite different. I want to give a small example of this. Small because it is a locational, very specific example. This comes from South Thailand. This is about a shrimp farm which arose from a mangrove. And in fact, this applies to a particular area in South Thailand. So economically, the logic was very clear. Shrimp farms worth $9,600 per hectare. And if you leave the forest as it is, the mangrove forest, then that's only providing you something like $600 per hectare based on the fuel wood that is extracted from there by the local community. Economic choice, very obvious. Convert the mangrove to a shrimp farm. But hang on. If you also look at the subsidies that the local government, the Thailand government, provides to the shrimp farm, well, that's $8,000. So if you subtract that, we are talking about not a, such a huge comparison, 1200 versus $600. But hang on, that's not the end of the story. Because having the mangrove there means that you actually have a massive store of protection from storms and cyclones as they get more frequent, especially with climate change. And not only that, but as a result of the shrimp farm, typically in, in three to five years, you end up having uh, to just reconstruct the whole area because salination and the de deposition of chemicals has basically destroyed that land. So you need to redo the whole area. That costs money, it costs about $10,000. And the value, you can work it out, of the, the mangrove protecting the area that you've, uh, that you've got along the coastline in terms of local communities, their housing, and their livelihoods, that can be measured in terms of areas which had mangroves and those which didn't, how much cyclonic damage they suffered versus the others. And that works out to something like $12,000. Now look at the trade of choice. And this is the whole point, that if you look at public wealth and include that in your trade off decisions, you get to a completely different answer than if you simply looked at private profits and worked your, your trade-off choice on that basis. You, in fact, you get the opposite answer. You get conversion as the right economic choice and not, sorry, you get conservation as the right economic choice and not con conversion. So is this just an isolated example from some small community area on the southern coast of Thailand? No. A calculation, a much bigger calculation like this has been done by a group in the UK, a research group called True Cost, and their numbers were quite staggering. They worked out that the so-called externalities, in other words, the cost to society of normal business by corporations with normal people like you and me, us buying things like cars, uh, petrol, and them selling it, and us driving it around and creating a carbon externality, or us buying fresh water for too cheap compared to where it comes from and creating, if you like, a negative fresh water externality. All of these added up, and pollution and so on. All of these added up, according to them, are something like $2.25 trillion. That's a huge number, fine, but it's also, interestingly enough, a third, almost a third of the profits of those 3,000 corporations. And you can imagine that this is 3,000 corporations, so there will be some corporations where their externalities, which means their cost to society of doing normal business, are actually higher than the profits that they generate. Now, is that a good business model? Have a corporation, license it, set it to work, and guess what? At the end of a few years, it's destroyed a lot more value than it's created. Hmm. Can you keep doing that? No. And that's really the challenge. And that's the challenge that corporations have to address and we as society have to address with them. Do they know? Well, if, you'd, if I'd asked this question three, five years ago, uh, probably I would have said, well, not really. But let me tell you a story from recently, as recently as January this year, when I went down to Davos after having spent some time in Dubai in a group preparing for Davos, which is the, the annual World Economic Forum meeting. In, in Dubai, uh, end of last year, there were 800 experts gathered, collected in 75 councils, each exploring some aspect of a global problem. And mostly they were talking about their own areas, like the Freshwater Council was exploring freshwater. But when we went to them, I was Biodiversity Council Chair, when we went to them, our group of 10 people, one by one, and found that the Freshwater Council was discussing loss of forest. When we went to the uh, Council on Food Security, they were discussing nutrients in freshwater and how that impacts them. When we went to the Council on Migration, they were talking about climate change, and finally we got talking about coral reefs and what happens in terms of migrations from coral areas. So all of the councils, when we found, we talked to them, 
almost 40 out of the 75 had identified a major problem, whether it was to do with security or education or fresh water or food or, or anything of, of the sort, had problems connected to biodiversity. In other words, the loss of the living fabric of this planet. The good news, therefore, is that in January, after that meeting in Dubai, in January this year at Davos, normally there's about one or two sessions which address nature. This time there were six sessions. And there were two on biodiversity, there was one on, on fisheries, there was one on the oceans, uh, there was one specifically on a scheme called Red Plus, which is quite, quite interesting, I might say a few words later. Um, and then there was a beautiful session, which was a whole room full of CEOs collected on tables, each discussing connections. Connection between biodiversity and food. Connection between freshwater and forests. Connection between forests, freshwater, soils, and food, and so on. Basically a cross-connected discussion roundtable on natural capital and how it is important and how the loss of natural capital is a potential threat to business. So I can certainly say that this year, and especially now, the business world and the business leaders are aware of it. The gentleman that you see on the left-hand side is actually not a business leader. He is the governor of the Amazonas province, the world's largest rainforest. And he was speaking, and you could probably see someone familiar looking at the distance out there. <laughs> a couple of years back, our T project, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, delivered its first report, or its interim report. And basically, we had three messages. It was a lot of work. There were 225 co-authors had written five papers and delivered a huge amount of analysis, but we summarized it in 50 pages. And basically the three messages were, firstly, that the sheer size of these losses is huge. We were talking about two to four trillion dollars worth of natural capital being wiped out every year as a result of losses, of business as usual. In other words, at the end of 50 years, we said, if we keep doing business as usual, that means natural areas of the size of Australia, seven and a half million square kilometers, would actually be converted to something else or lost due to climate change etc. And the cost of that to society, and if you put in a present value to that, that was the, the range that we, that we found out. And the range is because we use two different rates of discount, one which is 4% and one which is 1%. I don't want to bore you with discounting, but essentially it's a way of deciding what is something in the future worth to us today. It involves an ethical choice because who's receiving it in the future is your grandchild, who's getting it today is you. So it's not just an arithmetic choice, it's an ethical choice. And that is established now pretty much by the, by the community. Perhaps the most interesting, and that was the third thing that we found and, and broadcast as part of our interim report, is a strong link between biodiversity and poverty. The typical view that is taken is that somehow you can have, it's a choice. You can either have biodiversity or you can have a solution to poverty. You can either have development, you, you can have nature, you can't have both. And that's a false thinking that we, it is not the case that biodiversity is just the preserve of the rich. It's valuable to everyone, but it's an absolute necessity for the poor. And the poor gravitate towards biodiversity rich reasons, not because they're mad or because they're poor, because it, they get so much free that that is where it's best to live. We work this out in economic terms like this, said that, okay, what if the forests were lost? Yep, there would be an impact of, you know, depending on where you are, whether it's Brazil or whether it's, sorry, if it's Brazil, you probably have an impact of about 10% of GDP if you lost all ecosystem services. In India, 16%. In Indonesia, 21%. Sounds big, but you know, nothing particularly, particularly fast because we're not losing all the forests. This is about a total value being lost. But if you ask the question differently, saying, who suffers if you lose the forest? All right, so what do the forests provide? Flood prevention and drought control. Who suffers if the forests are lost? Ah, the poor farmer. What else do they provide? Oh, they provide nutrients and fresh water which grow, go from the forest into the fields and therefore provide the poor farmer, guess what, with his livelihood. The subsistence farmer once again. Who suffers if cattle can't go into the forest and feed on leaf litter? Oh, it's the poor farmer. Who suffers if they can't harvest bamboo and fuel wood from the forest? Oh, guess what, the poor farmer once again. So when we looked at to whom did the benefits flow that we are talking about, it was all to the poor farmer or to the poor tribal. So we re recalculated our, our numbers and said, all right, let's find out not what are ecosystem services as a percentage of GDP, but let's find out what are ecosystem services as a percentage of the GDP of the poor. Then we got to some rather more different numbers because then the answers were 75% in the case of Indonesia, 47% India, 89% for the Brazilian tribals and forest dependents. That's the point. 
that if you lose these forests, if you lose nature, you are actually making the poor poorer. You are actually hurting their livelihoods. And I think this is probably the first time that the economics of this was presented. I mean, this is something that was known to people who are in the field of environmental management, but the economics of this was presented, and I believe it did make a difference in terms of uh, bringing to attention to policymakers, especially in the developed development agendas, what is the meaning of ecological infrastructure? Why is it important? Why do we have to worry about nature? Why must we value nature? TEEB is actually uh, today now into its second phase, as, as Miriam explained. We are now looking at uh, pretty much covering all of the uh, end users, as we call them. Uh, a little story is that when I thought, you know, clients is what we call them in, in the bank, but I was told, no, no, don't be ridiculous. You can't call a government a client. They'll be offended. So I said, end user? They said, yeah, yeah, that sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we wrote, we call them end users. Later on, I started saying that, well, you know, client is an end user who pays for your services, but they don't want to hear that. So, <laughs> that's, that's right. uh, so we have the, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, you know, mark one, which is basically the, uh, the first deliverable, which is the economic and ecological foundations. That's on the website. We've also got on the website TEEB for policymakers, which is essentially looking at all these aspects of forests, of freshwater, how do you put values to them and how can you actually pay for ecosystem services. We then have something coming out later this year, which is in September, which is for local policymakers and administrators. It's all very well to have a national policy, but if your local rule just says you will create 2,500 extra jobs this year, well, guess what? You'll still destroy the forest because building a factory there creates 2,500 jobs. You'll still do that. So you need to have reasons locally why you need change. And finally, what has come out very recently, just a couple of weeks back, is the draft for TEEP for business. Because at the end of the day, corporations do rule the world, sorry, for those who are in government amongst you. And the reality is that they employ two-thirds of or more of, of humanity and their taxes, and that's a very important point and a, probably a very relevant point in Australia as the results of discussions happening on resource taxes or not resource taxes. The, the corporation taxes of the corporation feed the budget deficit. They basically finance the government. And that is important, and that creates the nexus between one and the other. So it's quite important for all of this to be understood and acted upon by corporations if it is ever going to make any difference. And last, and probably I should say first, because um, Lord Stern, who is, by the way, an advisor to, to our project, um, said two things on my, the first time I discussed this with him. One is when I told him what they had planned to call this project, SIBIOS. I said, what? SIBIOS, Stern Inspired Biodiversity Study. He said, mm. So I thought I'd better change the name. And the other thing he said to me was that, you know, whatever else you do, make sure that you include people and how this impacts people. So therefore, we have TEEP for Citizens, which uh, you'll be delighted to know is not a weighty tome that you'll have to sit and go to sleep over. It's just a website. It's, it's a website that's going to be called TEEP for me. TEEP for me, as in you. And it's easy, just log in there and play around with the value of your backyard or the value of <laughs> your national forests and what percentage of the national forests public wealth belongs to you because you're one of 23 million Australians or one of a billion Indians or whatever. Let's go back for a second to this rainforest. It's not just a carbon store. This is not just sticks of carbon sitting out there waiting for reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. By the way, that's the official name of a scheme that was launched in Indonesia many years ago and now reaffirmed in Copenhagen. This is not just about carbon. This is the world's biggest rainfall factory Okay, here's how. It's basically an Amazonian rainforest water pump because evapotranspiration from the rainforest actually seeds the winds that come in from, from the, the northeastern side, which is from the Atlantic, and they provide the water that feeds the agricultural economy of Latin America. So you get hundreds of millions of, sorry, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of agricultural output actually entirely dependent on the Amazonas and their rainfall. That means, you know, the state of Mato Grosso in Brazil, uh, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, all of those countries depend on the Amazonas rainfall's water seeding function. Great. So Governor Braga must be a happy man. He must be getting lots of money from all of these places. No, he's not, because he doesn't. They pay exactly zero, zilch, for this important and vital ecosystem services of freshwater provision. So we are actually trying to put a value to that and show that this is the extent of economic value that you are receiving free from the state of Amazonas because of the Amazonian rainforest and from other states where the forest resides. 
it's a way of reminding policymakers in that continent that yes, there is an issue here. And the lack of this is in fact one of the reasons why there isn't enough pressure to conserve the rainforest as against destroy it for wood and for conversion into more cattle ranches and, and more soya plantations. Another example for policymakers is to do with fisheries, and this is very much an international policymaker issue, global fisheries. We are fishing down the food web. We're basically going for smaller and smaller species, and, and uh, I know it's close to dinner, but I will mention that at some point we will be left with basically plankton and box jellyfish and other such fascinating stuff. So if anyone's got ideas on companies converting box jellyfish into delicious food, tell me, I want, I want to invest in them. There is a problem with fisheries, jokes aside, but open access and subsidies are the two main drivers of the problem. Open access means anybody and everybody can go into the seas and fish as much as they want, no, no constraints, no issues. You just can't do it within 200 miles of somebody else's coastline, that's fine. If you go into the deep sea, you can take what you want. And the other problem is, is subsidies, because the trawler fees which go into these open seas are heavily subsidized. Most of the subsidies of about 27 billion trawlers, uh, 27 billion dollars, per annum actually go towards industrialized fisheries. They don't actually go to the poor, uh, fish, small fishing boats. What's happening is that because of overfishing and because of, of this background of, of open access, fisheries are being lost very rapidly. More than a third of the oceans have less than 10% of the fish that they began with. In other words, they are, as we call it, depleted. So less than 10% means it's not commercial to go fish there anymore. If this continues, and there are many forecasts we receive suggesting that within 40 years, effectively there will be no fish, eatable fish, at least unless you're into box jellyfish and plankton soup and whatever. But basically the problem here is one of economic mismanagement and at a massive scale, at a global scale. The estimate of how much more productivity we could get if we manage this properly is about $50 billion per year extra. Subsidies, $27 billion. Can you imagine? $77 billion dollars per annum of economic waste in an industry that only lands 85 billion dollars worth of catch. That is what I call economic stupidity. And this has to stop. It's not good for anyone because lives are at, at risk in terms of livelihoods. 35 million people depend on fisheries for their livelihoods. These are jobs. And not only that, but the health issue is even bigger, which is that more than a billion people, in, mainly in the developing world, depend on fish as their main source of animal protein. Absent that, and you've created a problem with their their diet, and therefore a potential health problem of a magnitude that you really haven't imagined. Here's an example of what is happening, just to illustrate the point, which is that if you look at the green line, that's what the investment in trawler fleets and fisheries is doing. And on the flip side, fish stock is being depleted so fast that, in fact, the catch per unit capacity is going down. That's the red line. Now, economics is a science of scarce resources. It's all about scarce resources. The scarce resource here is fish. It's not fishing capacity. So if you are investing in something, you should be investing in ways of increasing fish, not increasing fishing capacity. And yet, every year, $20 billion are poured into increasing fishing capacity. That is called perverse subsidies. It is actually harming the economy, it's harming people, it's harming the fish, of course. Now, is there a solution? Some people will tell you that, yes, there is a solution. It's called marine protected areas. You need to conserve certain areas or have no-go areas, which means that basically fish stock revives out there. And, and the logic they, they use is that, well, allow a female fish to grow twice its size. It could produce 10 to 100 times as many eggs, and the net result is fish stock will come back. Maybe, maybe not. Is this true? Let's find out. Well, here's an example from George's Bank, which is off, off the coast of Cape Cod. I haven't picked this deliberately because of the cod having vanished, but it just happens to be there. And this is the area that, you're, that I'd like you to look at for a moment. The blue dots, green dots, and all the other dots are basically vessel hours. In other words, satellite-tagged vessel hours in the locations. And you can see that the protected areas, which is this triangle, that big triangle there, and that rectangle here, don't have any trawlers, or maybe just a few who've wandered in by mistake. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Overall, you might think, well, what's this guy on about? Mr. Sukhdev is wrong. The fishermen are right. He's denying them a livelihood. Clearly, they've got to fish outside these areas, and they must be affected by this, right? They must be losing livelihoods as a result of this. This is nonsense. Hang on. I invite you to look at this triangle a little bit more carefully. So here's the next picture. There. Where do you think the trawlers are right now? They are hanging around the edge 
of the protected area. Because guess what? No one told the fish that there's a protected area there. <laughs> so the fish just wander into the nets and they get picked up exactly at the edge. Of course it has it restocked. Of course the theory is right and the scientists are right. All that's happening is that the fishermen don't have the patience and sometimes their governments don't have the, the willingness or the understanding of this issue to just support them for the three to five years it takes to rebuild fish stock. So instead of spending $27 billion wasting, sorry, most of those $27 billion every year, the right thing to do is to spend some of that in supporting these fishing communities during the three, five or seven years it takes to restock and keep the protected areas as a means of providing for these communities. Clearly, that it does work, and this is not the only example. We've received dozens of other examples like this before. Good economics does work, and there are so many examples, I don't want to bore you, but let me just pick some from this list that I've got out here. Costa Rica, the Panama Canal, Toya Oka City, the Navicubo Swamp. Costa Rica is an example that worked at a national level, where Costa Rica is a small country in, in the neck of uh, the Americas, basically in Mesoamerica, between North and South America, in that little neck where you have Panama as well. Uh, in Costa Rica, they decided uh, as far back as 97 that they were suffering because of loss of forests, and they wanted to change that. So they, and they worked out that the reason for that was that basically forests were being converted to pasture for cattle, for beef cattle. And the rough yield for, for beef cattle per hectare per year was about $50. So the government decided to pay $50 per hectare per year to farmers who owned land, forested land, and in order to not convert it into more pasture because clearly that was having an impact on soil fertility and on fresh water and just on the look of the place. So they actually paid farmers to keep forests so that soil fertility could be maintained, fresh water would be improved, and effectively biodiversity would be conserved. The net result is that during these 13, 14 years, it really has worked. And not only that, but the increased fresh water has improved the hydroelectric potential of these areas because they do have some dams. And uh, today we have a situation where forest cover has grown in Costa Rica from around 20% to almost 50%. And the country is prosperous. Small farmers benefit as well. It's not just the rich farmers who have land who benefit because soil actually collects more nutrients as a result of the forest and that increases the productivity of soil downstream or close by where there are smaller farms with subsistence farmers as well. So it is an experiment that worked. Again, good economics. Another example I want to talk for a few moments is regarding the Navikubo swamp in, in Kampala. Here's, here's a case where uh, at some point the government locally decided, this is the capital city of Uganda, the local government decided that it would just convert the swamp into more agricultural land, 40 square kilometers, it sounded good. Then an economist came along and did a calculation, we have the study, saying that, look, the value, the present value of that agricultural output is something like of a couple of million dollars, but in fact, the swamp out there is uh, collecting the garbage, collecting the sewage from the city of Kampala. It is effectively a sewage treatment facility. It is working for free and is providing value, which is huge, and worked out the value of an alternate cost of a sewage treatment plant for the city of Kampala, which turned out to be almost 10 times the value of the agricultural land. So the government actually reversed a decision which was, it was going to take to convert and dam the swamp and block, block the area, to leave the swamp as it was, and it's still there. It's basically not designed as a sewage treatment facility, but it does that job tremendously well. I could go on, but there are more than 50 examples. So in September, if you log into the website, you will actually see about 50 examples of good policy decisions based on clear economics, showing that public wealth increase as a result of conservation is the right way forward. So. Does, is economics the solution? I mean, is there nothing that economics cannot save? I'm afraid that's not true either. <laughs> so here's an example of when economics does not save wild nature. Uh, this is about coral reefs, and of course you're all familiar with your own rather grand coral reefs in, 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 in the Great Barrier Reef. But coral reefs are, are beyond beauty, and they're not just places to go to if you're planning your next vacation or, or you know, places that will, if they die, force you to take a vacation elsewhere or go skiing instead of snorkeling. But they're actually those red dots, those are the tropical coral reefs. They are providers of livelihood and food for more than, half, more than 500 million people, more than half a billion people around the world, all the way from the Pacific Islands, Indonesia, Malaysia. These are heavily populated countries. Indonesia itself is 220 million people, Philippines, 75 million people, the Andaman Islands, Madagascar, 
the entire uh, area out here in the Caribbean. The problem is this, that we are, and this is what people think coral reefs will look like, but the reality is uh, that beautiful fish and coral grass beds and, and beautiful corals and so on is not necessarily what they look like. These are recent pictures. As a result of um, the loss of coral reefs due to blast fishing, due to just degradation, due to chemical runoffs, due to uh, cyanide fishing, which is leaving cyanide basically to kill off fish, um, and generally due to coral bleaching. These are the sort of images that you see today in coral reefs. The problem here is that we globally are targeting a level of carbon dioxide of 450 parts per million. And what happens is that as carbon dioxide builds up, it's already at about 390. It starts getting absorbed in the oceans. The oceans are alkaline, but as a result of absorption, they become less alkaline or more acidic. And that's really what ocean acidification is about. When an ocean acidifies, in other words, becomes less alkaline, the net result is that the natural regeneration of the coral reef is prevented. You can't get the aragonite crystal that, that forms out there to form. Problem, which is that at today's targeting in Copenhagen, or for that matter, in the climate process, we are targeting a level of carbon dioxide which most scientists believe <coughs> is too high for coral reefs to survive on an ongoing basis. Scientists have given us numbers of 320 ppm, 350, 380 ppm. Only one has given us a number of 480, which is higher than where we are targeting. So there is an issue here that you know, we are probably making a societal choice as a community uh, to not have coral reefs. Can economics save this? No, we, we can't. The last coral reef is probably worthless because you know, it, it just is too precious to put a price on. So we can't actually apply the logic of economics and marginal value when you're coming to the last unit of what's left. And that's where you need to make an ethical choice. So here we have it. We have an ethical choice. Sadly, this is an ethical choice which we are making kind of unconsciously, if you, if you know what I mean. We've sort of stepped into it and made that choice without necessarily having thought through the consequences. And the consequences are huge. 500 million people dependent, potentially 200 million displaced as a result of that. That's the biggest migration problem that the world would have ever faced. And it's nothing to do with politics. In some ways, you might argue everything to do with politics because of the climate agreement not being there. Another question, let me flip it around, is that what about the other way around? Can nature save the economy? We've gone through a, an economic crisis. This is not the first one. In my banking career, I've, I've lived through and traded through four crises of this kind. Uh, credit blowouts, you know, Latin American debt, you name it. Are we doing something wrong that could be righted by using nature better? And I believe so. And I think there are many examples of the risks that we are creating for nature and in, in the world being potentially solutions as well. Carbon dioxide emissions, guess what? You can make business out of biocarbon offsets and the Red Plus scheme. <coughs> Disturbing habitats and conversion of land, sure. You can make business out of biodiversity offsets and conservation banking. Freshwater overuse and misuse is a problem. We are using too much. But at the same time, you can make business out of payments for watershed protection. We have several examples of that actually working. Marine footprint, we heard about the fisheries. Does it have to go that way? No, you can, as the example said, make an additional $50 billion of value every year if you get sustainable fishing right. Pollution and waste, does it have to be a problem? No, you can make business out of recycling, out of tradable permits. There's a lot of opportunity here, and not only that, even for the poor, this whole issue of adapting to climate change is a serious solution because at the small end, at the level of the community, which is dependent on natural flows. Climate change is the biggest problem because it hits you on water security, it hits you on food security, and it hits you in terms of storms and cyclones. And regrowing the forests, replanting the coral reefs and getting the fisheries back, or replanting mangroves and getting the fish back as well as woodstock, is actually a way of stopping that. So yes, wild nature can actually help the economy. In fact, it can even save economics, that's my point. Today, we are in a world where economics really only recognizes man-made capital. But the reality is that there is also human capital and there is also natural capital. We are navigating. We are fixated on GDP growth. We are fixated on national accounts which don't capture nature. That's absurd because natural capital is actually the largest item on the balance sheet of the nation. So my point here is that we should, and we, we can and we should include nature on the balance sheet. And we have to recognize that today we are in a kind of spaceship, a spaceship Earth, if you like, 
we are navigating a spaceship, we should be having a bank of instruments that is huge, complex, and fantastic, and working really well. Instead, we are, we've got a mariner's compass. Looks lovely, but it's useless. We can't keep measuring progress at a nation level with GDP growth. We can't keep measuring performance for a company simply by looking at quarterly profits. Ladies and gentlemen, we need that change, and with that change, hopefully, we can get nature onto the balance sheet and provide the solutions that we are after. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavan. I'm going to invite the panellists to come up and join us on stage now. Just introducing them very briefly, uh, Jennifer Westercott is the partner in charge of KPMG's Sustainability, Climate Change and Water Practice in Australia, and she oversees all of KPMG's sustainability services. She's also the leader for sustainability and climate change across KPMG's Asia-Pacific um, works and she's the global leader for KPMG's sustainability strategy and she also has over 20 years of experience in state government so it comes from both the government and business perspectives. Um, Peter Cozier is the director and the founding member of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. Probably many of you will be familiar with their excellent work on water in Australia. Um, his work looks at the design of systems to mainstream the long-term health of Australian landscapes into our economic and social institutions. Please welcome Peter Cozier, who has um, come out despite uh, having to come up the stairs with, um, with a pair of crutches because of a, a recent uh, little accident, I understand. Um, Paul Gilding has spent nearly a decade working with large corporations and business leaders on sustainability strategy. Uh, this frontline corporation experience was preceded by a 20-year involvement with social change organisations, including a stint um, heading up Greenpeace. Please welcome all our panellists. Catch my breath. Um, look, thank you very much for the opportunity here. Um, I've just been asked to briefly mention to you an initiative that the Wentworth Group is actively engaged in in Australia at the moment, which on the face of things uh, to most people looks quite mundane and even bureaucratic. But after Pavan's talk today, I think you'll probably get to understand the significance of it. It's an initiative to build a regionally based set of national environmental accounts. And we're looking at trialling this model across Australia over the next 12 months. And then when we're successful, we hope to take it to the world. Let me start with a positive note. For those nations that rode the, ra wo for those nations that rode the wave of the Industrial Revolution, it has created staggering wealth. We are without doubt the wealthiest, healthiest and most educated generation in our history. Since Australia became a federation in 1901, average incomes in this country have grown from $6,000 per person in today's dollars to over $50,000 for every man, woman and child. Our political systems were built to manage the Industrial Revolution, where the great contest of the age was, to, was a contest between capital and labour. We have, as a nation, become highly skilled in economic management, highly skilled in the social sciences, education, health, law and order. Our problem is that our political institutions were designed at a time when the natural world seemed endless, when nature was there for the taking and where land clearing was part of a heroic vision to develop the nation, where fresh water flowing to the sea was considered to be wasted. If we're to have any hope of addressing the challenges that we've heard tonight, we're going to have to apply the same discipline to environmental management that we currently apply to managing our economy. And it's a very simple principle. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. What we need are national environmental accounts that tell us, region by region, state by state, nation by nation, the health of our key environmental assets and any change in the condition of those assets over time. National Environmental Accounts of Australia proposed in what we call Accounting for Nature model are, are effectively simply biophysical accounts. They do not attempt to aggregate with economic accounts within a single measure. And the reason for this was best expressed by Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel Laureate for Economics. He said recently, when driving a car, 
a metre that added up one single number, the current speed of the vehicle, and the remaining level of petrol would not help any driver. Both pieces of information are critical and need to be displayed in distinct, clearly visible areas of the dashboard. We need a set of environmental accounts that sit alongside the economic accounts for the same reason. <coughs> now this sounds all impossibly complex, but it is in fact remarkably simple because our model for environmental accounts takes its design principles from 100 years experience of economic management of the Industrial Revolution. Yes. It creates a common environmental currency from which all assets, uh, which is being capable of managed at, applied at any scale, it makes use of the vast array of, of existing scientific information that is already be, being collected, and it simply aggregates this information to produce accounts that can be used by anybody. Before money was invented, people exchanged goods and services in a barter system. The creation of money, a common environmental currency, a common environmental currency, sorry, a common currency of exchange, revolutionised the world's economic system. The magic of an environmental currency is the same. It will do the same thing that the economic accounts do for managing nature. It will allow us to compare the relative health of a sand dune with a river, an estuary with a rainforest. And in doing so, it will create the platform for managing our natural resources as effectively as the economic accounts underpinned the management of the Industrial Revolution. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I've been asked to talk about uh, pricing. Um, I want to take a broader perspective on this because I think there are three sets of issues to really manage here. Price, cost and value. So the first thing that I think if we want to do this sort of thing in Australia we need to do is to stop seeing economic growth and environmental health as in competition with one another. The second thing as part of that is that we do need to recognise that the environment does have economic value. But we don't have good tools for this. We know how to measure the cost of environmental failure more than the, the value of environmental health. That means we know the value of something too late. But we don't have some good tools here, so I absolutely agree with Peter about a national set of environmental accounts. But we also need better ways of, me of measuring value and how we actually measure long-term value versus short-term value. The third point about pricing is that we know for major economic transformation and the major economic transformation that we need to undertake to deal with greenhouse gas reduction, we have to change the incentive structure and that does involve putting a price on greenhouse gas emissions. One hopes that's the starting point for the Citizens' Assembly. But there are a variety of natural resource issues where we're not putting in place the right incentive structures, leaving price just to one side for a minute. For example, we, we don't have any schemes in Australia where we've got incentives for environmental stewardship and we don't have market mechanisms for environmental stewardship. We're not pricing water effectively, particularly in the urban context. In the rural context, we've done a lot of water reform and we've still got a situation where the environmental water holder, a very good initiative of the federal government, is trading permanent water, so it's seen as a loss to farmers as opposed to allowing farmers to participate in a water market where they sell water to the environment when it needs it, where they take water when it needs it, and I'm sure that would get a lot more engagement with that community if it was seen to be a market mechanism where everyone was a beneficiary. We don't have proper incentives for land clearing, reforestation and building and infrastructure. So the key issues in terms of that incentive structure are who pays, and we could have a long debate about that which I won't go into, and the role of subsidies, just to pick up on Parvan's point. If we looked across Australia and did an audit of all of the subsidies that government is putting into a variety of industries, we would find a great deal of money washing around in that system. The difficulty is that those subsidies are never linked to environmental stewardship. They are in fact a free good to continue to consume more. If we linked those subsidies to incentive structures and to regulation which was about environmental stewardship, it probably would not cost as much as everyone thinks. The fourth issue about pricing and cost is that we need to understand the real long-term costs to communities and individuals and the real long-term costs of inaction. When we say to the community, it will cost us more in the long term, I'm not sure they entirely believe this. And we have to put some more real examples in front of them. 
The Australian community is now spending nearly $30 billion trying to catch up on water infrastructure and water conservation and effectively to secure the water supplies of major cities. This is not coming at no cost to the community. This is coming at a very significant cost on people's water bills. And we're not engaging the community properly that if we delay these decisions about more efficient use of our natural resources, ultimately they will be paying for the catch up. And finally, we need to see the positive side of this. There are many examples where more efficient use of natural resources will come at a profit. It will improve the bottom line. It won't be a negative cost to business. And we've got to get started on some things. One of the difficulties in this whole issue of pricing and market me mechanisms is that we want to design a Rolls Royce that never gets out of the garage. And we've got to be very careful about creating complex schemes that don't recognise the asymmetry of participants here. Farmers, fishermen, major corporations aren't all going to be equal players in very, very concept, uh, complex market mechanisms. So they have to be designed in a way that allows people to participate easily in them. But the critical thing is to get started. If we try and design these perfect schemes that have absolutely no flaws in them, we will make very little progress in this matter. Thanks, Jennifer. The, I want to make some comments about how I think this is going to unfold, like how this will all translate into action and, and what time frame, and then finish with a question, Pavan, for you. So I guess my first response is that, again, great data, great frameworks. We've got, I'm looking forward to being an end user and using the uh, information. Um, but, you know, great information in there, obviously a very thorough analysis. And yet again, we have kind of more evidence of the logic, more evidence that, you know, we, we have a serious issue here and that these are not just environmental nice to have issues, these are fundamentally economic issues. So I think that's important to acknowledge this is, this work's always important and yet we still don't get the change. Mm. And so the question of my focus is why don't we get the change and how will we get the change? And looking at that in the Australian context, I think we are a classic kind of microcosm of the world in that we have a very cold, you know, CO2 kind of intensive economy amongst the highest per capita in the world. And we have some of the biggest impacts in terms of our, uh, of our economy, in terms of how this unfolds to us, in terms of loss of reefs and so on, in terms of direct economic impact. So despite the fact that we know that and we measure that, and with these sort of reports we can measure them better and better, we still don't get the change. So in Australia we're sort of stuck again in this cycle of really earnest agreement that we should do something, sometime, some other time, but not now. And everyone agrees that that's a really important thing to act on, but we don't actually don't do it. So I think, and I'm not sort of just saying that isn't that terrible. I'm saying that's, that's the important issue. The important issue is why don't we act and how do we act and when are we going to act and how do we get ready for that, both in Australia economically and more importantly globally. So I guess my kind of challenge to you or my question to you really is around that. That I, you know, how I see this as unfolding is unfolding as an economic impact for all the data that you've got and put in that report. What that says is that degradation of the environment has an economic impact. Now that's not just a theory, that's a practice, practical fact. Therefore it will have an impact and therefore my view is that how it will unfold is that it will have an economic impact and that will prevent us from growing the economy anymore. Mm. That if you're running it as we are globally at around 140 per cent of capacity in terms of sustainability, that doesn't keep on going. You don't keep on using up your capital indefinitely. At some point that unfolds in economic impact. So I guess that's my kind of question to you is, how do you see this unfolding? I mean, how do you see this actually translating into economic impact and then into political impact after that? Mm. Now, Pavan, while you respond to that, I'm going to ask everyone who has a question to race along to the microphones <laughs> located there and there. Again, just a reminder, please, uh, one question per person, short, to the point. Um, and I am talking a tweet length question. So Pavan, do you want to respond to that briefly? Sure, thanks. And, and also to the, to the points made by, by the other two panelists. I think the, the first point that I'd like to address is, yes, the economic impact is something that needs to be measured, and it has to be measured at the national level as well as at the corporation level. Uh, what you do not measure, you cannot manage, and I think that's been a mantra that I've been reciting for, for a long time at least. And I think what you've described, uh, Peter, and what the Wentworth Group has worked upon is an interesting and practical, practical way forward in terms of measuring environmental impacts at the national level. What perhaps is also worth repeating, although you did bring it up, is that these impacts would have an economic dimension to it. So you would be able to measure a value number against the quality of the environment, a value number against the extent of forest, the availability of fresh water, the quality thereof, et cetera, et cetera. So the first step is to get this framework set up where you are actually recording value and you're doing it at a national and a state and a, and a locational level. 
The, the other key vehicle, if you like, of our, of our economy these days is, of course, the corporation. And I believe that one of the key ways in which we can move the corporation forward into recognizing its impacts, because whether we like it or not, the purpose of the corporation is its own self-interest. Its purpose is to create more capital for its shareholders. And we can keep objecting to that, but that's law. That's the way it works. The only way we can impact the shareholders and through the stakeholders, if you like, that's you and me and, and the governments, is to make regulation arise which forces the corporation to be more transparent. In other words, if it's got 10 million tons worth of carbon emissions, it should state that in its, in its report. If the value of those emissions or the cost of, social cost of those emissions is $850 million at the stern value of, uh, of carbon, well, that should be disclosed. And there should be a rule which says how you disclose this based on the social cost of carbon or whatever rule you wish to choose. But there should be a rule. So there has to be a lot of calculation, a lot of standardization, and a lot of disclosure. When that disclosure happens, in other words, when these economic impacts are not just being calculated by the TEAB report, but in fact being calculated at the company level and at the nation level and reported, people will recognize what's happening. This is your life. This is your economy. This is your wealth that's going down the tube. These are your fisheries, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's, that I can't emphasize how much information is worth if you have the right information and how dreadful it is when you don't. Because if you do not have that information available, then measuring and managing simply does not happen. So that's in terms of the impact side. Now, the other side is behavior change. We are all consumers. We are all citizens. We each have a, a local uh, representative in, in a parliament. And I think that's the other point that I, I will make, which is that change will only happen when consumer behavior changes as well. So in addition to disclosure, which affects national planning and affects at the corporation level, it affects investors and it affects analysts and the way they examine a corporation. We have to also change behavior. And um, I was given a lovely story about how Brisbane actually had something called T Target 140, where they targeted something like a fifth of their original water consumption and actually managed to achieve it over a span of some years by just managing their freshwater use more carefully. So clearly that was a question of consumer management and I believe it can be done. It has to be done. First question. Mm. Fiona Way in Environment Business Australia. Um, Pavan, thank you so much for your totally refreshing, holistic, brilliant outlook on things. Um, the right information, it also depends, I think, on our perspective on that right information. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, coming out of the Copenhagen meetings, time and time again, we heard coal is cheap, new infrastructure is expensive. Both are absolute furfies. Um, because we're not costing the, co the collateral damage. Could we perhaps imagine things like Australia being a regional hub for minerals processing, supply chain manufacturing, food production, based on renewable energy and drawing down legacy carbon from the atmosphere and rebuilding our soils and our agricultural productivity? Mm. Well, uh, uh, applying what we've just heard from the panel and, and my, my summary comments on that, uh, clearly if you draw out coal and if you don't record that on your national balance sheet, which doesn't happen, then you would appear to be making a huge profit as a result of exporting the coal. But if you start recording the value of that coal on your balance sheet and saying, ah, this year we have 5% less, oops, this year we have another 6% less, oops, now it's another 7% less, effectively recognizing the value of depletion and use, not simply just treating it as if it's a free good. The reality is that the earth isn't making coal under Australia at the same rate at which you're pulling it out. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a bank where you're putting money in at one rate and pulling it out at another rate, guess what happens? The bank balance goes down, wealth decreases. The idea is to start recognizing that wealth and reflecting it. So I think that's the first step, once again, trying to pick from what we've just been discussing. And the other is, of course, the externalities, uh, so-called costs to society. And yes, there is damage. There's health damage in some countries. There's environmental change. And there's there's uh, emissions costs and so on. So I think it does need a bit of further um, discussion and, and projection by people in terms of account for this wealth nationally and recognize its costs. A third dimension, which I would say, again, in context of coal, is to realize that its extraction for that matter, any mineral extraction, is actually a contract between you as the community and the corporation which is given the extraction right. So the, the license, if you like, the, or the fee for the license is basically what you as Australian citizens are contracting with the corporation. 
it's really up to you to decide whether that contract is a fair contract. If you're contracting it too cheaply, well, you should speak with your government about getting a better price for it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Hi, Bronwyn Darlington from the Minimal Footprint Company. You mentioned business, you mentioned transparency and supply chains. One of the challenges we have in Australia is that 90% of our goods come from offshore. Yeah. So how much of an influence can we have when transparency is not available um, and so we don't necessarily know what the impact would be on the value of the nature in the distant sort of shores. Yeah. The, the importance of certification can't be uh, overemphasized. And, and you're right to point out that this is not just a, a single nation initiative that will change that. At the end of the day, it's quite difficult to have trade agreements which are based on, you know, we will only import what is certified. It's, it's a huge negotiation process. You can end up with significant complications if you go that route. So therefore, there has to be a variation of Doha, if you like, a variation of the international trade regime, which looks towards certification as an accepted means of managing uh, impacts of, of what material or what raw material or what goods and services are actually exported. Uh, I believe that certification made not just uh, locally but internationally is probably one of the only ways forward in that direction. Some progress is being made in that, in that sense. There, there are uh, certainly situations in Europe, which I'm aware of, where countries are looking at certified timber products from rainforest nations and, and uh, creating different rules for certified versus uncertified. So there is some initial progress, but there's a lot more to be done. Um, Jeremy Walker from UTS, University of Technology. Um, thanks for a very uh, informative talk, and um, I enjoyed it a lot. I wonder if we could go back to your slide where you looked at the Amazon rainfall production. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah sure. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, well, just let's remember back to it. Um, I think it's. Uh, I, d I noticed that you that there was a company there called Canopy Capital, and um, I was very interested in that slide because uh, I remember reading a report that Canopy Capital, a financial firm in Britain had purchased the right from the Guyanese government for the yeah. rainfall production capacity of uh, a section of its rainforest. Yeah. Now, um, earlier you mentioned that obviously corporations require profit. So where's the return for a company that yeah. now owns the rights yeah. to, um, yes, canopy capital? Well, so uh, actually, the, where's the return? So if right. I could just finish my question. Um, OK, now yeah. I know that you're not advocating, perhaps you're not adv advocating this, but yeah. if a company owns somehow requires the right to own rainfall from a government, um, well, how do they get a return from that? Does this lead to mm -hmm. the privatisation of rainfall, for example, that the farmers going to be required to pay for their mm -hmm. rain now? Um, are they going to buy it from financial mm -hmm. corporations like Goldman yeah. Sachs, for that, So, uh, I, I get the question. That's why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so can questions be in, in tweet size, please? 140 letters in future. But well, a short answer to that is that, yes, they did acquire the right. Um, it's basically 370,000 hectares, from what I remember, of, of rainforest. But not just rainfall. It was all ecosystem services, only 20% thereof. Uh, so they were recognizing that the country and, and the state and the local community keeps the remaining 80%. But even which what I consider as a fairly equitable kind of deal, that hasn't worked out as yet, because there is so much disagreement on the ground as to whether a, an outside party should be given that right, and if so, at what price. Uh, so the, the deal is still on. It's not, it's not yet closed. So it, it explains the difficulty of achieving that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, speaking of tweet length questions, we have had a couple of questions come in from Twitter, and I might just um, throw them mm. to the panel now. So we had one question about growth and whether even with nature on the balance sheet, uh, it might be necessary to slow growth down uh, in order to achieve some kind of sustainability. And we had another question about um, you know, this big accounting job of, of putting nature on the balance sheet. Uh, do we actually expect corporations to take that extra work on voluntarily? So perhaps start with the first question. Paul, do you mm. want to take the growth question? Sure, I know to. you've had a mm. bit my of a conversion favorite, on my this. My favourite topic. Mm. Yeah, I, I've been advocating for a good 15 years that sustainable growth was the answer, that we had to find ways of dematerialising in order to grow the economy. I think it was completely wrong. Um, <laughs> it's a good idea at the time. And the reason it's wrong is just because the mass doesn't add up. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. Basically, you cannot grow an economy. I mean, you can dematerialise, become more efficient and so on, but at yeah. some point, you exceed the capacity of the earth to grow. And at 140%, I think we're probably well past that point. So you have to, you know, and, and numbers, this area is full of numbers, but, you know, we'll be four or five planets by 2050, I think 70 or 80 planets by 2100. That's not going to happen. Mm. 
Mm. Now, it's not going to happen, not because we don't want it to happen. It won't happen because it physically can't happen for all the reasons that you've been arguing in your report. So I guess the, the point I would answer on that is not that we need to decide to stop growing the economy. Mm. The economy is not going to grow. Mm. Right? So it's a very different idea than a philosophical point of view. Mm. There are mm. physical limits to growth in the current model, and I would argue in any model eventually, mm. and therefore mm. at some point it's just going to stop growing. Mm. And at that point we'll start waking up because we do care about the economy not growing. We don't care about loss of biodiversity, but we do care about the economy not growing. That will get our attention. And that's what I think will start to face up to the issues that we're talking about. Mm. Mm. And it, with a Stern-inspired report, uh, I understand that Stern has recently you know, been looking at the numbers and is starting to come to some of the same conclusions. So what is Teeb telling you? I think Teeb is, is forcing us to recognise that, yes, there are these limits to production-led growth. Uh, what we are still arguing is that we can look at growth because there's sunlight still coming in on mm -hmm. the earth and being absorbed. You can still look at growth in capital, including natural capital. That potentially can grow. But that doesn't mean that the flow of goods and services can keep increasing or that the rate at which you're extracting to feed that flow of goods and services can keep increasing. On that point, I completely agree. They're just mm -hmm. At 140%, you're already too high. 140% mm -hmm. too high by definition. Mm -hmm. And, and that is not a sustainable model. And to be honest, growth, uh, I mean, there are very few species other than one I know of which just can grow interminably and actually think it's okay. <laughs> um, most species kind of stop at some point and settle down to a number, but mm. we don't seem to think that. Mm. Yeah. And just mm. one more quick comment. It, if you look, I've been writing a book on this stuff, I've been looking at the history of the issue, and all the early economists, mm. Keynes, Adam Smith and so on, all talked about mm. growth being a temporary phase. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'd achieve the point where we got to a sustainable economy and that would become the higher point yeah, of development. That's right, that's right. And we'd become kind of addicted to it, but there's no logic to it inherently in economics or mm. anywhere right, else. Anyways, yeah. Yeah. I like to s compare it sometimes to the difference between growing when you're a child, where you know growth in your body mass is a good thing, and growing as an adult, where you probably want a different kind of growth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on to the voluntary reporting question. Yeah. Maybe Pavan and, and also Jennifer would like to take that one. Sure. Just, I mean, Jennifer on the voluntary first, yes. reporting mm -hmm. one, I mean, a lot of two things. A lot of organisations are already doing this. They're already disclosing this because mm -hmm. they can see a risk and an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. A lot of organisations have already got an internal carbon price, for example. They're already pricing carbon in their in, in their production of goods and services. Most organisations are need to understand the responsibility of the resources they're consuming. So when you actually say to people you're consuming a litre of water to produce X goods and services, do you realise the cost of that? Most organisations don't know that. So if they're doing their job properly in terms of managing shareholder value, they will actually try and understand the value of the resources they're consuming. And the second thing that organisations ought to be doing to create shareholder value is understanding the risk to those resources. Mm. I mean, accountants like us impair assets mm. when, they're under, when they're at risk. And Organisations need to start thinking about those modern accounting tools and those modern valuation tools and starting to put a different perspective on this and saying, well, I know, do I know the value of that resource in the production of goods and services? And then the second question is, do I know the risk of it? Do I know the risk of supply? And I think a lot of organisations are starting to understand that, they're starting to do a lot of work on it and they're starting to put it into their financial statements. I think the, the need for that uh, is, is fairly clear. And I think the good news is that, as you, as you rightly point out, Jennifer, some companies have started doing that. Uh, even if they value or themselves value their impacts on society or themselves value sometimes their positive impacts on society in terms of training and education which companies provide and create more human capital, I think it's a good thing for them to be encouraged to do so because it will only add to that wealth of information that's available as some countries hopefully step forward as leaders. And force the issue by saying that, yes, we want, in addition to the uh, balance sheet and the P&L and the, uh, the statement of contingent liabilities and the statement of post-balance sheet events and so many other disclosures that are there in the annual report on accounts of the company, we also want an annex which says natural capital externalities and another one which says human capital externalities. That is, if you like, the end game. That's the, that's the dream world where we are headed. But the heading towards that is going to be a long and laborious process. Make no mistake, this is probably the ultimate intelligence test for humanity. And the silly thing is that we can't fail this one either. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, thank you for that talk. Uh, you touched upon 
uh, a point in the coral reef example, and I'd like to invite you to elaborate on that. Um, within the internalising externalities approach, you mentioned that there's an absence of an ethical framework. And so whilst costing previously uncosted natural goods incorporates them into a market structure, mm. this supplants moral or ethical obligation, such as intergeneration equity that you mentioned, with yeah. a purely economic framework. What space, therefore, is there for these ethical concerns mm. within a purely cost-based analysis? So we're left with an appeal to a financial mm. bottom line. There's yeah. no space for a, the moral concern. The, the TIVA approach actually is, it begins with that. It begins with the uh, societal approach. Interestingly, the chapter on valuation, which has been published in the TIB report, uh, uh, the TIB Economics and Ecological Foundations, is not written by an economist. It's not written by an ecologist. It's written by a social anthropologist. He's the lead author. So that shows you where we are coming from. But within that overall space of valuation by society and valuation as an institution, we also believe that there is a role for economic valuation. Because at the end of the day, the economy is important. And of course, there are things like friendships and love and, and marriage and so on, which you don't find market solutions to. I mean, if you're having a divorce, you, there's no market where you can go fix it. But basically, the reality is that there are certain things which you value which do trade in markets. And for those things, yes, we argue the market. Now, the problem is, Marginal costs and marginal returns work in certain circumstances. They work where there is surplus. But what if you're in a situation, the coral reefs, where there is no surplus? You are short coral reefs. You lost 20%. You're going to lose another 20% over the next you know, event that takes place. And you are at a temperature level where you know that the long, long game, and some people say 100 years, some 50, some less, the long game has got to be that the entire uh, uh, genre of, of species is going to be lost altogether. Uh, simply because it can't, the corals can't survive at those temperatures. So, you know, we are in a situation where we've kind of made an, a, a societal choice. The, the sad thing is that I think we've made that choice without actually knowing that we've made it. And so this is the other problem. We've, so we've got market failure, information failure, institutional failure, the works, all of that happening, and a big problem. Uh, economics is there to solve problems in the areas which are market determined and which are policy relevant. Beyond that, you can't. Hi, my name is Katerina Kamali from the Centre for Sustainability Leadership. And this question is to you, Paravan, and also to you, Jennifer, having worked in government. Uh, you mentioned the importance of a discount rate as an ethical decision-making tool, and currently both the New South Wales government and the federal government have a discount rate of 7%. Do you see any way of reviewing or reforming this discount rate in light of your presentation this evening? Well, I, I, I can really, I, I can't comment for the state, but I'll certainly say that uh, conceptually we have to distinguish between interest rates, which are the rate at which you discount a cash flow in the future, one year forward versus today. For that, maybe 7% might be the right answer. Then you have to look at discounting over the long term. You have to look at discounting of goods and services. And then finally, you've got to differentiate that from discounting for, for society. You know? A cash flow belongs to someone. It's somebody's payment to somebody else. A good or a service belongs to someone or is consumed by someone. So you can think in terms of an individual's discount rate there. But the moment you're looking at something which is a value flowing from nature to society, not now but in the future, it's a societal discount rate that you want. So the question is, what's the right rate? And that can't be determined by some formula, some arithmetical formula. What you're really saying is that if I'm picking, for example, a 4% discount rate, for discounting the flows of nature. What I'm really saying is that the discount factor in 50 years' time is 0.1375. I just didn't calculate it. I know it, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> I'm a normal person like most of you. So, but but 0.1375 is, is basically means that something like that flow of, from nature is worth one-seventh to your grandchild compared to what it is to you. Well, would you be okay doing that? I mean, you know, would you be able to face your children or me, my children, and, and their children? Would I be able to do that? I don't think so. It's, it's a difficult ethical choice to make. And that's really the background as to why social discounting versus uh, goods and services discounting versus cash flow discounting is actually different things. You need to treat it differently. Yeah, I, I'll just, I can't really add much to that other than to say we need to understand what we want the role of discounting to do. What behaviour you do want to change or incentivise? Um, and how are you going to, to measure that? And then if you do discount, what, what are you getting in return for that? I think the, the difficulty that we've got in public mm. policy across Australia is that discounting is often a last-minute effort to get people over the line to agree mm. to regulation. 
It's not actually about the behaviour you want to change or the value you want to create. And it often never comes with any condition about environmental stewardship mm. or some kind of return on government investment. That I think you can actually change in New South Wales and Australia. But people really need to do a lot more work on this. And in my experience, discounting was often used really as a means of saying, look, we can't really get agreement here, so let's apply a discount rate and see if we can get people over the line, as opposed to what is the thing we actually want to achieve, what's the behaviour we want to change. And with that, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, I, just, just quickly, I, I, it's very easy to look at a lot of this in the context of the current election campaign going on in Australia and say, well, are we just suffering from analysis paralysis? You know, Stern put a price on nature and we're not really moving forward. Um, you know, what, what is all of this good information actually achieving in the political world? And I, I think one of the things that we need to do about trying to reframe that debate is we need to redefine what we think of as realistic. We often get told that, you know, fast action, that actual climate change science-based action or environmental science-based action is unrealistic because it doesn't fit into the current political framework. And uh, certainly, um, Pavan, I'm going to be sending that haddock catch slide off to Tony Abbott. I'm not <laughs> sure if anyone's heard about the proposed moratorium on uh, marine parks, but I think that that's one slide that he probably needs to see. Um, but in, in that context, you know, it's very easy to think that, okay, we're locked in a permanent stasis here. But actually, political change can happen very rapidly, very surprisingly. Progress is always progress against the odds. It's always progress against opposition from vested interests. Um, and, you know, people used to think that ending slavery was unrealistic or that extending the vote to women was unre unrealistic. And, you know, we made a little bit of progress there. <laughs> um, just quickly, uh, on, your, um, on your seats or uh, in your laps, uh, you will see a flyer that um, has a little bit more information on Pavan, uh, on the important work that he's doing. It also has a donation form, um, so I can't resist the opportunity to plug this. Um, CPD makes all of our work available for free online. You can go and check all of the past papers that we've done. We just released a book called More Than Luck, Ideas Australia Needs Now. Um, and so you can access all of that at uh, cpd.org. .au. The address is in your flyer as well. Uh, so we make all of that available free. We've actually made the book available under Creative Commons licence, so anybody can just pick up extracts from it and republish it willy-nilly. Uh, but doing all of that does obviously cost money and we would very much appreciate any support that you can give. Um, just a quick thank you to the Opera House for hosting us tonight. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Pavan and the panel, obviously. Thank you to you all for coming out on a cold winter night in Sydney. Um, I think that we uh, had our hosts a little bit surprised by the fact that we had a sold-out event for an environmental co economist. And <laughs> that, if nothing else, is a reason for hope. So a big applause to Pavan and the panel. Thank you very much. This is Big Ideas from the ABC.